Well, Julie, I'm not seeing it. Oh, there we are. All right. Welcome everyone. My name is Lynn Crawford. I'm with the Hope Dementia Support Groups, and it is my honor to introduce Dr. Derek Scoville to you. He is with the Scoville Psychological Services. He and his, uh, his wife, Elizabeth Ann, have their business together, and uh, it is our great pleasure to have him tell us about testing for neurocognitive disorders. So, Dr. Scoville, it's all yours. Oh, you, prior, man. pardon me, I forgot one thing. And that would be that if people have questions, if you will type them in the question box under Q&A, and then we will ask them when he's finished. Thank you all. Now it's yours. Thank you, Lynn. Good evening, everyone. And thanks for joining us for this talk this evening about testing for neurocognitive disorders. Uh, my name is Dr. Derek Scoville. I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. I want to begin this talk by sharing a little bit about myself. As I mentioned, I'm a licensed clinical psychologist. I'm licensed in the states of Washington and in Oregon. My area of practice is geriatrics and health psychology. To explain this a little bit more, I'll say that a lot of times when we think of psychologists, we might think of a psychotherapist, somebody who sits in an office and um, conducts psychotherapy with patients. Uh, very little of my work um, is psychotherapy. Most of my work um, has to do with um, treating of uh, patients who have who are older or patients who have complex health problems and it's the combination of their um, health or medical problems and their psychological problems are are what are the focus of my practice so most of the time i'm i'm at a skilled nursing facility um, i've been working at skilled nursing facilities for about 20 years now and I also go to one long-term acute care hospital. So that L-T-A-C stands for Long-Term Acute Care Hospital. Um, that hospital is over in Portland. A long-term acute care hospital for those who may be interested is that um, there are patients that need to be hospitalized for many months because of complex medical problems. And so they can stay at a regular acute care hospital like Legacy, um, Salmon Creek Medical Center, or let's say Peace Health Southwest Washington. And so the LTAC is a place where uh, there are around the clock doctors and nurses to take care of patients. Um, and lastly, I do work at our outpatient office. Here I do some psychotherapy and I do some uh, psychological testing, which is what this, this talk is about. Uh, to start with, um, as a psychologist in ethics and morals, uh, we always have to begin by saying that the views and opinions presented here today are, are mine. And I'm solely responsible for the information presented here. So I'm the one you'll need to um, forward any complaints or concerns about. So that's just part of the talk that I need to present with. So I'm just going to move us along here. If you notice the first slide, it was talked about a neurocognitive disorder. I didn't use the word dementia. So before we get into testing and talking about testing, I wanna just begin with a little bit of background. And to start with, that means familiarizing everyone with some terms if you haven't already um, been made aware of them yet. We used to use dementia as the only term to describe cognitive 
problems and impairments. Um, but this changed with the advent of the DSM-5, which is the Diagnostic uh, Statistical Manual 5, which came out several years ago. And, and at that time, we began to use the term major neurocognitive disorder. These two terms are interchangeable. If you are talking with the psychologist, the psychiatrist, probably most people in the mental health field, you will hear the term major neurocognitive disorder or a neurocognitive disorder used more commonly than dementia. With your primary care physician or most other physicians, let's say, you may still see the term dementia. The DSM-5, this diagnostic a statistical manual uses the definition of a major neurocognitive disorder, but we are also using the ICD-10, which is the diagnostic uh, criteria that's used um, internationally. And the ICD-10 codes um, really are what predominate the medical field. In those terms, um, still use dementia. Um, whether it's the FO 3.9 or the FO 2.8. These are just um, the codes, but they, they always still use dementia as an ICD-10. So please don't get confused. Um, the central point of this slide is just to say, know both of these words and um, just understand they, they're essentially um, de by definition the same thing. Another important point I want to talk about is differentiating dementia from other kinds of common neurocognitive conditions because there's several and there's important differences between them. The first that I think some of us are, are familiar with um, and it's probably the easiest to bring up as an example is delirium. Delirium or sometimes you'll hear the term encephalopathy. Delirium is a condition of altered mental status that often results because of um, a serious medical problem, a medication, or it may be um, due to an infection. Uh, delirium happens a lot of times, if you think about it, with high fevers. Many of us can remember having a high fever and just mentally not feeling ourselves, just our mind just seemed to uh, play tricks on us or function very slowly. We experienced um, just um, some weird ideas, maybe even visual hallucinations, um, or just, uh, just we're, we're not making sense when we talk. So, um, Delirium or encephalopathy is a, um, a very different condition than dementia. Uh, most of the time, um, the, it, delirium is something that doesn't last very long. It, it's just something that comes and goes. Um, usually when you treat the underlying cause of delirium, it resolves. And another thing about delirium is that it can even come and go over the course of the day. So someone might seem very delirious or have very significant altered mental status in the morning, but be fine in the afternoon. So this coming and going, this waxing and waning, this um, of, of a mental status, it better defines delirium and is not consistent with dementia. Dementia is a chronic or it's an ongoing um, neurocognitive disorder that does not go away. The other important point too here is dementia is not mild cognitive impairment. Mild cognitive, Im mild cognitive impairment, or sometimes you'll just hear it as the um, MCI. MCI is a, is a um, lesser form of, of uh, dementia. Sometimes it's its own condition. Sometimes we think it's a precursor to dementia, but it's a very mild form of, of a cognitive impairment. 
Um, it is persistent. It is um, typically chronic. Sometimes it just stays the same, um, but sometimes when we think of MCI, we think of this um, in some cases as being the, the, the beginnings of dementia, but the impairments aren't severe enough They're to warrant a diagnosis of dementia. Um, usually people who have a mild cognitive impairment are still functioning quite high um, and are living very independently, um, almost at baseline um, in some cases compared to um, how they were in terms of their pre-morbid or um, pre-existing intellectual abilities. So what is dementia then? Dementia or a neurocognitive disorder is a very significant disturbance in the following that you can see on your screen. This is a disturbance in attention, executive function, memory and learning, language, perception, motor ability, behaviors, and then of course, we um, see that the combination of those um, domains above have an impact on functional ability. And what ADL stands for is activities of daily living, and I, ADLs, stands for instruments of activities of daily living. So, um, let me talk briefly about each of the um, aforementioned domains. So attention is being able to attend, uh, to concentrate, to, to focus your mind on um, something that is at hand in front of you. Um, there are different kinds of attention. Um, there's passive attention, such as when we're watching TV. Um, the TV watching a show requires us to make sure we're watching what's happening and if there's a storyline or something of interest that we're reminding ourselves to, to pay attention to that and to hold that in our mind. But there's also other kinds of attention um, that are more involving in terms of complex and sustained attention. And that's, that takes a more active attention. That requires our mind to be more active and engaged with the task at hand. Think of playing um, cards, for instance, um, especially if it's a new card game and you've never played it before. It requires a lot more attention than um, if you have already played for a long period of time or compared to, let's say, watching TV. Your, your mind has to remember rules. You have to pay attention to what you're doing. You have to pay attention to what all the other players are doing. You have to have this, um, this, comp this complex sustainability to really attend to what's going on. And that's very important. In, in, in cases of dementia, um, this starts to be damaged and, and to uh, dysfunction. Executive function is um, a term that applies to judgment, logic, rational thinking, um, being able to sequence ideas. If A comes before B and B comes before C, then A comes before C. So executive function is this um, basically uh, this terminology to describe how the frontal lobe of our brain is responsible for complex ideas, um, understanding um, and abstracting and thinking in a coherent, logical, rational way. And so that's very important. And with dementia, this starts to become affected. Memory and learning are linked here because they go hand in hand. If you're having problems with memory, it's very hard to learn. And often when I'm talking about learning, I get questions or thoughts about, well, learning is what I did when I was in school. And now that I'm not in school anymore, I don't learn. And that's not true. We learn each and every day. Learning is the process of being able to attend and synthesize information and place importance on it in your mind and say, oh, I need to remember this. This is new. I didn't know that before. So in order to, to learn, we have to remember. 
And so memory here is not just remembering what happened a moment ago, but memory is also um, being able to store information from short-term or immediate memory into delayed memory and short-term memory and being able to consolidate that, even recent memory. And this helps us um, in terms of our learning because we're able to forget things that are not important for us to remember, but also to be able to have a brain that um, anticipates and then consciously or even almost on an unconscious level is storing information to um, enhance um, our learning and the memory. Um, enough said on that. Next is language. Um, lang we, are, we are creatures that speak. We are creatures that write. Our brains are incredibly designed with intricacies about the use of language. And language is um, just so it, it connected into our brain. It's, it's just one of the most important things that we, we, um, we do as creatures. My, my father, as a, as a psycholinguist, was often uh, fond of saying that we're not animals that walk upright as homo sapiens. We're actually animals that talk. And that is really very um, specific and unique to us as beings. We have very, very complicated ways in which we speak and in, with, in, in how language works. And it's just amazing um, how those operations work inside of our brain. Our brain is also responsible for perception, meaning we touch things and we taste things, we smell things, and we also see things. And with dementia, there often is a disturbance of perception. There becomes impairments to hearing. There becomes problems with um, a visual perception. And those are more commonly at issue. Motor ability is the ability to move our hands, our fingers, our, our legs. Mobility is so important to us. And so um, we're also beings that move. And we move because we do things. Our brain is um, always excited and enhanced with this ability to go and do and be able to physically um, move ourselves around our surroundings. And so um, one of the issues with dementia can be that there is dysfunction or damage to the areas of the brain responsible for uh, motor ability. Behavior in this domain is a more complicated um, domain. And I don't mean it just to say uh, just doing things or behavior is, um, is just an action. I, I want us to think of behavior as um, just like the functional abilities described below, that we drive cars. We have behaviors of being able to use a phone, use a, a computer, um, we have behaviors in which um, we use social skills. Um, we understand um, just looking at somebody else to how we might empathize with what's going on with them. So our behavior here, I want us to think more complex about what behavior is, um, whether it's good behavior or sometimes um, inappropriate or bad behavior, which is usually the challenge that occurs with dementia. So next is the most common causes of dementia. And um, I, again, I, I'm trying to get some background here before we get into the testing piece, because I think this is important to understand that there is not a singular kind of dementia. I want you to think of dementia as a category. Those of you who know me um, or have heard me talk before, I remind us that dementia is a medical term, much like cancer is a medical term. All cancers are similar to one another, um, but they all have different causes and they all appear a little bit different. Dementia is the same way. Dementia is a medical term. It's a umbrella term of under which there are different kinds of causes to that dementia. And I mention this because often I'll hear, well, my mom has dementia, but she doesn't have Alzheimer's. 
and that's incongruent. Um, dementia is the category and Alzheimer's is a type of dementia. It's just that the dementia in this case is caused by Alzheimer's disease. So for most of us in the statistics that we have today, Alzheimer's disease is probably the most common form of dementia. And that is classic in forgetting of things that happened recently and then a slow progression back in time. And as there's more and more forgetting, there's more acute problems with those different domains that I mentioned in the last slide. Without going into too much detail on any of these diseases, I'm just going to do a quick run through um, the more common ones. Frontotemporal lobe dementia or frontotemporal lobe disease is another very common neurocognitive disorder slash dementia. Um, this was a condition that was not so well known and sometimes considered to be attached to um, something called Pick's disease. But this is now its own unique condition and we actually think that over time it's been underdiagnosed. So there seems to be a, um, a more prevalence of this diagnosis, but I don't think it's more of it. I just think that we're diagnosing it more accurately because we have more studies and data on what exactly this disease is. Lewy body disease is another fairly common form of dementia. It is a combination almost of Alzheimer's disease and Parkinson's disease. It has an element of an amnestic or a storage problem to delayed memory, much that's similar to Alzheimer's disease. But at the same time too, there seems to be a profound motor disturbance or motor movement element of the disorder that's affecting the brain in which um, resembles in some ways the freezing or the in immobility that occurs with Parkinson's. It's also prominently um, has um, problems with sleep at night where there's some intricacies about um, people who are dreaming falling out of bed and oftentimes there's very significant hallucinations. I think besides Alzheimer's disease, um, the, the kind of dementia I see most often, especially in, in skilled nursing facilities, is cerebrovascular disease. And by this, I mean individuals who have had a stroke. This might be a stroke because of bleeding in the brain, like a hemorrhage. Other times the stroke occurs because there's been stenosis or an occlusion, meaning that the blood flow to the brain or parts of the brain have been blocked and therefore blood doesn't get to those parts of the brain and therefore the parts of the brain on the other side of the blockage um, become damaged. So this is fairly common and a lot of times uh, cerebrovascular disease or this kind of um, dementia is attached to other kinds of chronic health problems. I see this very often with patients who have um, heart diseases and oftentimes diabetes as well as morbid obesity. Um, I think the, more, the most common reason why I see uh, dementias at the long-term acute care hospital that I mentioned before is because of traumatic brain injury. So we think of traumatic brain injury as being another form of dementia. And this can be because there's been some sort of blow to the head, um, such as in a car accident, um, or maybe this is um, what happens with um, soldiers who've been in combat. They can experience um, explosions um, from IUDs and particles um, hitting their heads or construction workers who've been in an, in an accident in which you know, um, something is, has struck them. So that is um, more the case with the traumatic brain injury. Another uh, co uh, cause of dementia would be substance abuse or medication abuse. Uh, this is um, a little bit more common now than I used to see. 
Um, the greatest generation tended to have more, I noticed, alcohol abuse or dependency problems. Um, with the baby boomers, I've noticed more and more patients with long-term cannabis abuse and or other kinds of substances, um, as well as just um, patients that with psychiatric illness who have long-term use on benzodiazepines or hypnotics, um, either to quell their anxiety or help them sleep at night. And this becomes, um, an, this over time can be very detrimental to the brain in terms of how the neurons become damaged from these medications or substances from long-term use. Um, I've also seen, um, although rare IV infection can lead to dementia, I think I've seen one case of prions disease, which is so rare, I wasn't sure I was ever gonna see it in my lifetime and probably doesn't bear any um, mention other than the fact that it's extremely rare. Um, other common dementias, though, that uh, most of us are probably going to be um, somewhat familiar with are, are Parkinson's disease, of course, um, Huntington's disease. And then certainly there are um, cases where I've had patients who've been exposed to severe toxins over time, um, including people who worked in chemical factories or um, worked in um, paint um, industrial plants back long in the day before there was OSHA, or um, I ha I've had patients who worked in dry cleaning with poor ventilation for many, many decades, again, before OSHA and poor ventilation. And so this kind of toxic exposure um, over time can cause neurological damage as well. So, now on to why you really want to um, be paying attention to this talk and you're probably smiling and thinking, good, we're, here we are. So first of all, um, how is testing helpful? And in, so I'm going to offer several points here. So testing is helpful and the reason why psychologists like testing is because it clarifies a diagnosis. As I pointed out just a moment ago, um, one of the questions that a psychologist or a neuropsychologist is going to have is, is, is this really dementia? How do I know that it's dementia? Is this not mild cognitive impairment? Is there a possibility that this might just be a form of delirium? So testing is helpful because it first clarifies that in fact the person has dementia. But the other thing that it's going to do is it's, if it is dementia, the testing is going to help because it's gonna clarify probably what is the kind of disease that is causing the dementia. So for a psychologist, when we can diagnose what is the kind of dementia, but based on the disease, we have research, we have studies that then allow us to anticipate what the progression of that disease is going to look like because they're all a little bit different. Some can stabilize, meaning some dementias may not get much worse. Others can get worse very quickly. Some might get worse very slowly. And so this is important information because once we understand that element, of course, it helps us to um, offer suggestions about care and treatments. Another reason why or how testing is helpful is that sometimes it's not just as clear as one cause or one disease is causing the dementia. Sometimes there can be multiple factors. And this is important too, because we wanna make sure that we're understanding all the contributions or what doctors will call comorbidities that are occurring so we can better understand what's going on. And part of this is that sometimes something might look like, well, it sort of looks like Alzheimer's, but 
it's not quite. There's sort of something else going on here. And sure enough, with testing and um, good workup, we're able to realize or point out that there is in fact something going on um, besides the Alzheimer's disease. Oftentimes that can be cerebrovascular disease. Um, so just a little bit more on that. A lot of times with the head imaging that I look at for patients who have Alzheimer's disease, it's very common to see that they have um, microangiopathy or small vessel ischemic changes. But it would be erroneous to say that the cause of the dementia was cerebrovascular disease or, or some sort of like mini strokes or TIAs. In fact, it is Alzheimer's disease. But what's happening is that there also seems to be this underlay of some cerebrovascular disease, which is leading to how the symptoms don't quite look as classic as traditional Alzheimer's disease. So again, I'm, I'm probably going on and in, in, um, elaborating too much on the point, but we, it's, testing is important just to uh, clarify other contributing factors. Another factor too is that um, we, when testing is helpful because we want to understand how severe the symptoms are. And testing is a way to do that. It really helps us um, define if this is mild or if this is moderate or what is severe. And again, because when we're testing and we're able to start to understand how significant or severe the symptoms are, because we've identified the type of the disease causing the dementia, we're really able to start to better understand um, what to anticipate in terms of the severity of the symptoms. And as I mentioned before, testing is helpful because it gives us treatment recommendations. If we know what it is, we know how it progresses, we understand the severity of it, we understand all the other contributing factors, this makes it a lot easier for psychologists or neuropsychologists to say, hey, um, here are some very clear treatment test or testing or treatment recommendations based on our testing. Um, and in in this is probably what to expect here, but as time goes by, you'll need to change your treatment to this because the, of the progression of the disease and such. How testing is also helpful is that it helps us determine a level of care. And I think this is a very common question or concern um, when I'm doing testing or when I'm providing assessments at a skilled nursing facility. Um, this is a question that comes up a lot by caregivers or loved ones or family or significant others. Um, husbands and spouses want to know, well, can, can, um, can they come home? Or I'm, I'm feeling like I'm in over my head. I, I don't know what to do here. Um, is, is this an appropriate level of care? And so testing is very helpful that way. And I'll talk a little bit more about that at, when I get more specific about the kinds of testing psychologists do. Um, one last way that testing is helpful, and again, very common to be a question at the time of referral, is does, does the examinee or the person have capacity or, or are they competent to make decisions? Should, should they be driving? Should they be um, signing checks? Is this somebody who can, um, we're thinking about doing a reverse mortgage on our home. Um, I'm wondering if, um, you know, my mom, for instance, is able to do that. You know, so testing is helpful in this regard to provide more of a, a clear answer on this one. Yes, no, maybe they have ability um, or competency to do certain things, but clearly in other ways, they're not competent in others. So why do testing? Um, unlike clinical opinions, um, testing is very helpful because it is a statistical measurement. It removes any opinions. It removes any guessing. It removes any 
chance of bias uh, one way or the other because the tests are all standardized. These are tests that um, use um, norms, uh, meaning uh, when they, they've given the test to, to sometimes thousands of people, they have a bar graph, statistical graph of what is the normal range, what is the high range, what's the low range, and this defines pathology, what's normal, what's, um, you know, and then to varying degrees, how, again, how bad is it or what is the range of abnormality. So this is, this, this is what makes testing so powerful. Um, the other important thing about testing is that when, when they're given, they are valid. They, meaning when you test somebody, um, the testing really is a measure of what is going on with that person then and there. It is a very valid measure of precisely um, what is the issue. Um, and, and each test is designed or validated to test something very specific. So um, that's very helpful and that's very, very powerful um, um, as a tool um, as when you were doing reports or when we're trying to describe what's going on with someone. Another important element of testing is that they're reliable, meaning that we can give the same test over and over again. And on some cases, there is an issue of retest reliability problems, but that usually occurs with simpler tools for cognitive screening, not the kind of testing I'm talking about. So retest um, uh, reliability or the ability for me to give a test, let's say now, to have a baseline of what's going on with the type of dementia, how bad is it, um, what are the recommendations, etc., is then very important because let's say five years from now, things have changed dramatically. We can give the same tests and this, that those same tests will be just as valid as they were um, a few years ago when I first did the testing and the reliability stays the same. So I can compare the scores now to, or five years from now to the scores that I administered and got now and draw a comparison and very important conclusions about what's changed, what hasn't changed. And, and that allows um, for more information and discussion about what's in the best interest of care and treatments. There are different kinds of tests. And I want to begin explaining a little bit about this because if any of you go in for testing or helping a loved one with testing, it's good to know a little bit about what to expect and, and, and to know some of these things. So some tests that we take are, or we administer are going to be subjective tests. This is, there's really no right or wrong answer. It's more of a self-report there are symptoms and you're saying, yes, I have that, no, I don't. Um, I have it all the time, I have it some of the time, I never have it. So these are subjective tests. They're not, they're not any um, different than just, yeah, a self-report measure. Nevertheless, they are reliable and they are valid, meaning they are meant to test what they're supposed to test and we can um, administer them over and over again and have this reliability that if let's say you take a subjective test on depression now but and you're fine um, but let's say six years from now you are depressed you can give the same test and and your self-report will look very different because you'll endorse the test items very differently um, basically scoring in ways to say, yes, I am feeling sad. Yes, I am feeling hopeless. Yes, this, that, and the other. Um, but that is, um, those are subjective tests. Um, the more, more common test that I end up administering or, or much of the time that's being spent with um, neuropsychological or psychological testing 
um, are objective tests. These are tests that are, um, they have right or wrong answers. And so those, that's a little bit different. Um, and so it's important to anticipate those kinds of questions um, when you're going in for testing. So who does um, dementia testing? And there's a variety of professionals that will do some sort of uh, testing. Um, this can be primary care physicians, this could be um, neurology as an area of specialty. Um, we have gerontologists um, that will maybe do some testing. If you end up at um, a hospital or also at a skilled nursing facility or even in the community, it's very common that speech and language pathologists um, will do testing. Um, Another, um, just like the speech and language pathologist, occupational therapy will also do certain kinds of um, cognitive testing as well. And certainly, as I've been alluding to in this talk, clinical psychologists and especially neuropsychologists do a lot of dementia testing. So then the question is, what's the difference, meaning different tests are administered by different professionals. Um, and this is important to realize because um, there's a different level of test, a more simpler test that those other professionals will administer compared to psychologists and neuropsychologists. So in this slide, I'm just trying to point out that um, certain professionals can administer basic cognitive screening tests but the most complicated, the most um, difficult tests um, are prescribed by psychology. So let's just go into this um, a little bit more. So what um, this slide for the cognitive screening test for dementia that most uh, professionals are going to administer are things like the mini mental status exam. Um, this is also called the, the Folstein test. It's a measure that was very popular and used quite often when I first started practicing um, a number of years ago. Um, but I don't see this test too often anymore, mostly because the statistics on it weren't very good. The mini mental status exam basically um, is good to screen between people who are normal and people who are very impaired, but it's very hard to differentiate the middle ground which is why I think um, most professionals that do any kind of cognitive screening these days are using something called the Montreal Cognitive Assess Assessment. Um, it's also called the MOCA, and that's M-O-C-A for Montreal Cognitive Assessment. Uh, another one that's very common is uh, one that I think it's the Department of the, of the VA put out. Um, the Veterans Administration, and that's the SLUMS, which stands for the St. Louis University Mental Status Examination. So there's the SLUMS and the MOCA are probably the ones that most of us are familiar with, but essentially all of these cognitive screening tools are about, are fairly similar. What they do is they've taken specific test items from other uh, more complex tests and combine them into a single form in administration. And this allows for test items to pull for areas of impairment in different domains without going into, into too much specificity. So as I pointed out a moment ago, only clinical psychologists and neuropsychologists have the education, training, and experience to administer the most sophisticated cognitive tests. And in fact, if you try to buy any of these tests, you can't. Um, in order to purchase them, the, the publisher of the test requires a, a, a lot of educational information. Um, you have to show your diploma, you have to show your license a lot of times, um, there's a lot of information you have to send in to uh, the publisher before they'll even release the test to you, um, let alone collect payment. Um, and the reason for this is that um, 
administering these tests is, is, is very complex and it, it, takes, it does take a lot of education um, and training. And, and this is a, a lot of what the coursework that clinical psychologists get in graduate school and neuropsychologists. Uh, there, are, there are whole semesters, sometimes whole blocks of the year that are devoted to, these, um, to learning these tests, how they were made, um, their weaknesses, uh, what they, they pull for, when to use them, how to score them, um, all the intricacies of these tests. And there's a lot of them too. And so it's very important to have the education on the theory of why they were developed. And I could go into a lot of detail here, but suffice it to say, these are very complex tests. And so there's a very select few professionals um, basically only clinical psychologists and neuropsychologists who can administer them. So um, when, when a, let's see, where am I at? So specific tests are chosen to administer based on the reason for referral. What I'm getting at here is that um, when a physician, a primary care physician or neurology or um, or family calls in um, to request testing, you, you should expect that there's going to be some questions about what is the reason for referral? What, is, um, what do we think the purpose of testing is going to be? And what is it that I'm trying to test or understand? And the reason why these questions are so important at the outset of examination is because they're going to guide the clinical psychologist to decide what tests they're going to administer. Sometimes an area may be very difficult or a domain may be a little bit more challenging and one test helps a little bit more to understand an element where another aspect of another test might help. And then sometimes we might wanna just make sure that um, we got it correct. So we might decide, well, even though I'm looking at this one area in this one test might um, pull or help me to understand what it is, I'm still gonna give two tests because I wanna double up on verifying um, this piece of information because it's so critical to the reason for referral. And, um, and I know that each test is gonna tell me a little bit something different. So, but this is very important. And so psychologists are thinking about this and, and what they're going to do then is we're gonna create a battery of tests that we're going to administer. So what, what is it that clinical psychologists are, are basically doing when they're doing their testing? Um, in the, in the evaluation. What we're, we're really trying to get at is um, an assessment that helps us to diagnose and make uh, treatment recommendations. And the key areas of testing that we're gonna focus in on are cognition, behavior, and emotion. I put personality in here because sometimes that is a matter that comes up is to understand the character or personality of a person. Um, and so sometimes I might administer a personality test, um, especially um, when I'm just doing a regular psychological evaluation. More commonly though, when I'm considering um, testing for dementia, I'm focusing in on those domains of cognition, behavior, and emotion. So I want to talk a little bit about a neuropsychologist because some of you may know of this area of practice, others may not. And you might think all clinical psychologists and neuropsychologists are the same and they're not really. My wife is Elizabeth Sawyer Scoble. Dr. Sawyer Scoble is a neuropsychologist. She is a clinical psychologist. She has her PhD in clinical psychology. But unlike myself, she has extra specialized training that is even more specific to understanding the function of the brain, um, understanding uh, very complex nuances of brain function, um, the disease process, um, 
understanding more specifically about brain damage and how that affects behavior, cognition, and emotion. And so it's even more um, synthesized into um, a, a greater degree of specificity than a, a general clinical psychologist. And in some cases, this is very important and necessary. Um, often my referrals might come from primary care, but in Dr. Elizabeth's uh, case, often her referrals are coming from neurology because they're dealing with a very complex neurological um, disease or case and they need additional information to help them understand and determine the nature and significance of, of what they're dealing with. So by comparison, you know, what are the domains that we might see, you might see on a neuropsychological test? These are a lot more specific domains that um, a neuropsychologist will go into compared to mine. You saw mine are a little bit more um, general, uh, cognition, behavior, and emotion. Whereas with a neuropsychologist, they're going to break down in their report and they're testing each of these domains with uh, um, as pinpoint precision as they possibly can. Going into the intellectual functioning, executive functioning, memory and learning, language, attention, concentration, Remember, some of these are the areas um, that I mentioned before, affected um, and or become dysfunctional or damaged because of dementia. And so, um, so those domains are there. We also have visual, spatial, or constructional processing. So that is that, um, remember I was talking about perception earlier and talking about how we see and how seeing can be affected by dementia. So visual, spatial, or constructional is basically testing the domain of being able to understand how someone's uh, vision and how they perceive may be damaged or impaired um, because of a, 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 a neurological disease leading to dementia. Um, there are also very specific tests to deal with the speed of mental processing. That's how fast your mind works. Um, or in my cases, my wife likes to tease me how slow my brain sometimes seems to work. Um, there's also motor processing or motor dexterity. Remember, also there's a motor disturbance. Remember that when I was talking before about an area of the, um, that is affected in dementia. So there are very specific tasks that can pull for this motor processing speed or dexterity that allows for some understanding about whether or not the disease process has nicked that. Lastly, there, um, there can be personality and emotional testing, but there's also very specific tests that provide for a good understanding of ADLs and IADLs. And so there are neuropsychological tests or functional tests that can be administered. I sometimes will administer them too, that help us understand what is the level of someone's ability to independently meet activities of daily living, such as taking pills. Can they make a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? You know, what are they, are, can they um, perform other kinds of basic tasks? Or is it that they are so um, impaired on these functional areas that they are really dependent on somebody else to be handling those things for them, such as, making change or writing checks, or maybe even that they shouldn't be living independently because they can't meet their ADLs on their own anymore. And again, this is um, how testing can be helpful is to say, look, this is a person living at home. And when we've done these adaptive and functional ability tests, we see this is a person who needs a higher level of care. Um, and that might be an adult family home, or if the dementia is severe enough, it might say, well, we're really thinking this may be memory, memory care, something along those lines. Okay, last slide, and then we'll be wrapping up for um, some time for Q&A. Um, what to expect if you have testing? Well, one of the things that you're going to need to expect is that you'll come in for a clinical interview and you're gonna be asked a lot of questions about um, 
your life history and your personal circumstances. Um, it, it's basically a psychosocial assessment to understand as much about your life as possible, who you are, um, what happened to you, uh, your health, um, your education, any military service, things along those lines. You need to know that testing will sometimes last several hours. Um, neuropsychological testing in particular, especially if it's a big battery, may last three to four hours. And in that case, you might expect to have the testing split up because it's sometimes very hard to sustain attention and, and be able to sit for uh, two to four hours. Um, and so sometimes the test will be split up in two hours in the morning, two hours in the afternoon. A lot of times at our office, we'll just break it up over the course of two days, coming in for two hours, let's say one day, and maybe coming back for an hour, or maybe two hours the next. When you're going in for your testing, please get a good night's sleep, okay? You may be worried, you may be nervous, but you need a good night's sleep. Sleep is really important. You want to be rested. You want your brain to be rested and you to be emotionally feeling well and um, just in a good place and your, your brain rested and ready to go with the demands of the testing. Um, eat a nutritious meal. And if you are somebody who gets hungry and you need a snack, bring along a snack. Our office has snacks. Not everybody likes our snacks. Some offices don't have snacks. I think it's always best to be safe and, and bring something that you like to eat. Um, and, and especially if you're someone whose blood sugars sometimes run low. Uh, I get asked a lot, how do I study for this? And I always say it's like studying for a urinalysis. Um, you cannot study for these tests. They're very, very um, sophisticated and complex tests. Um, they are very robust. They are tests that were designed um, uh, over the course of many, many years by very, very intelligent theorists and, and uh, test construction people. You cannot study for these tests. Do not bother. It's not going to help. Just get a good night's sleep, come on in, and you just want to do your best. Um, if you're on medications, please make sure that you talk to the clinical psychologist or the neuropsychologist or their office in advance about your medications. There may be some medications that we want to be thoughtful about um, in terms of what you're taking before you come in. Um, good examples of this is if we're testing for attention and concentration and you're on a medication that's a psychostimulant, um, you're going to do a lot better on the motor processing speed um, and you're going to do a lot better on the mental processing speed because the psychostimulant just did, um, did its job. Um, likewise, we have patients that are on um, sometimes sedatives or they have pain problems and so they're taking opioids for very good reason because they're struggling with pain. Even some anticonvulsants, um, patients who are diabetic and have neuropathy, they might be taking gabapentin and as a side effect, sometimes that can really be um, lead to a kind of a cognitive dampening or slowing. So please inform the um, examiner or their office about what medications you're taking, because there may be a conversation with you and your primary care physician or whoever the prescriber is about those medications before you come in. Um, you will also want to um, realize that you may be asked to sign a release of information. Uh, if you're the examinee, the release of information might be for a spouse. Um, the release of information might also be for your primary care physician. It might also be for the neurologist or just for somebody else to get a copy of the report. And I guess in closing, before we go to Q&A, I think that just come into testing with a positive attitude and the idea that you're going to do your very best. Some of the test questions are going to be incredibly easy. Others are going to be hard, but you're going to be able to figure them out. Some are going to be just downright too difficult, and you're going to maybe realize, I just do not know the answer. What's important is to do your very best, and it doesn't hurt to say, is it okay if I guess? Because sometimes guessing 
um, usually never hurts. And you might guess right, so you might get an extra point. Um, a negative attitude or a bad attitude is not going to help. It's going to worsen your performance, especially if you're very anxious. And I think if you have any test anxiety, sometimes that's good to let the examiner know. Just, hey, I'm going to do my best, but I do get very nervous and I might talk to myself a little bit. And so, you know, cheer me on a little bit or just say, hey, good job. Um, Another thing I'll just comment on because it comes up and you saw me scratching the back of my neck is I'll get a I'll get a examinee that'll come in with their spouse or their son and it just really becomes tr uh, really problematic because um, they just don't want to do the testing and I just say look uh, you're going to need to do the testing and if you can't do the testing I'm just going to assume you can't do the testing and that'll be in my report. Um, so always, it's always best to do what you can on the test. And if it, if you just can't do it, it it's just gonna, it, it, you just can't. Okay. I'm going to leave it there because I'm pretty much sure I talked over my time. Um, and let's go to Q and A and I'll, I'll do my best here to answer your questions. All right. So the first question is if I wanted a baseline test for future reference, how much would that cost? I was in a coma for two weeks in 1985. I fully recovered, but just wondering. So question, um, baseline test in a coma two weeks um, in 1985. How much is that going to cost? Um, I think that's, um, I think if you're going, if you're paying out of pocket, uh, and you want to pay out of pocket, the, I would call around and talk to the psychologists um, and neuropsychologists about what their fees are. Um, I would suspect the neuropsychological tests um, may be a little bit more expensive, but they may run about the same. Mm, I would say you should expect somewhere between about 100 to maybe $175 an hour um, if you're paying out of pocket. Um, if it's less than that, I wouldn't be too sure that they're that capable. Um, the other thing that the psychologist will do or the examiner will do is they'll, they should tell you how many hours they're going to be spending on the testing or on the examination, you know, like one hour for the clinical interview. I'm going to spend one hour reviewing records. I need three hours of testing, and then I'm going to be spending five hours of writing your report. So expect this to be about 10 hours at, let's say, 150 an hour, you know, something like that. Um, and then you'll get a flat fee. But I also think that you might talk to your primary care physician, um, especially if you have any um, concerns about cognitive impairments, because if your primary care physician makes a referral for cognitive testing, even a baseline testing, um, your insurance may cover that. And before you even ask your PCP, you might want to talk to your insurance provider first um, to find out whether or not that's something they would cover. Thank you. Is there any way to determine what type of dementia my mother has for hereditary concerns if she was never tested and is probably not capable of being tested? Oh, okay. So what I heard is that um, it sounds like uh, the mother has very severe dementia at this point and it, they're not able to be tested. And then the concern would be, well, is this a type of dementia that may be, a, have a genetic load and or am I at risk in terms of heredity for this? Uh, that is a very good question. I, I don't think there's any testing for that. I think that would be more of a consultation that's sort of like a forensic 
diagnostic examination where it's really trying to decipher what might be your risk factors versus your um, the mother's risk factors uh, for developing um, this uh, dementia. Certainly some dementias, um, we, we could figure out what kind it is, and then some have a genetic load, other, others don't. Um, and then there's other protective factors as there are other risk factors that would have to be considered um, in terms of what is the probability or propensity that you might um, end up with um, a dementia. But again, I don't think it's really testing. It's more of um, this uh, exam, this different kinds of pathological examination, if, if that makes sense. I'm he says, yes, <laughs> it does. Okay. All right. Can you speak to the use of imaging for diagnosis of dementia? We often hear people ask, okay, so why did they do this scan and that scan and, and why and which one? That's a good question. Very good question. So the, the purpose of, of imaging is really to just have a picture of the brain to, to um, look to see what might be there and um, to explain what might be the disease or the etiology of, of the cognitive impairments or potentially the dementia. Um, oftentimes, the imaging that we see in Southwest Washington, a lot of times in Portland, would be a CT scan. And the CT is generally, a, um, an a, it, it's a sophisticated x-ray as I best recall, but it's a it's a general imaging uh, test and it's fairly inexpensive, but it's pretty good for what it can do. Um, the CT is helpful because you can have it with contrast um, in, in um, usually that involves comparing and contrasting a CT from 1917 to now. Or, or I'm sorry, 1917, 2017 to 2020, you know, the last three years, how did these two CT scans look differently? I think CT scans are helpful to see generally what's going on with the brain, tumors, um, areas of brain damage. Um, they'll sometimes be what they'll call a CTA of the neck and head to look for blood flow or the fancy word is perfusion. Um, but sometimes the CT scans aren't always very accurate. I have very often, I think two times a week, someone go to hospital, shows up at the emergency room with classic stroke symptoms. They get a CT scan and it's negative, meaning it didn't show anything. Then they get an MRI and the MRI shows, yep, there was a big time stroke in the pods. Um, it's in the basal ganglia. The MRI sometimes too, they'll do, they'll do in dye injections and they can pick up a little bit more that way. Um, but those are the two that we see the most common here in the area is CT and MRI and that's usually because of cost. There's other kinds like SPECT and um, there's a new one out and I'm, I don't remember the name of it, but it is just an absolutely incredible, beautiful test that really shows um, all the intricacies uh, of the brain and, and, um, and, and colors of it. And it's really quite astounding um, how the resonance on that can pick up very, very small details, um, which really then allows um, for analysis into what area of the brain is affected and damaged. Um, so did I answer all the questions about that? 
I think so. The one exception would be possibly the use of PET scan in uh, particularly in Lewy body dementia. Yeah, with oh, I, yeah, okay. So with Lewy body, I think you might get a CT or an MRI. Um, I don't know that necessarily there would be more testing or more imaging needed than that. Here's the caveat, and I, this is what I remembered now that I wanted to say about head imaging. I have seen head imaging that is just really concerning for very serious damage. And then I meet the patient and I talk with them and they are pretty darn good. And when I test them, they test really good compared to their head imaging. I have had the reverse where I have seen head imaging that doesn't look too bad and I go talk to the patient and they are not doing well at all. And when I test them objectively on paper, they really do not perform very well on tests. So I do think test head imaging is helpful I think it helps to elucidate what might be the disease or the damage um, attributing or contributing to the, um, the dementia. But really testing is really is what um, bears out what is wrong, how it's wrong, where it's wrong, and what the wrong means in terms of the extent that it's impacting the individual. It, it, the, the head imaging can't, I, I would be very cautious about drawing any conclusions solely from um, head imaging. Okay, thanks. Um, one of the things that we hear most frequently from our group members is uh, uh, a family member with frontal temporal dementia and how difficult their behaviors are. Yes. So how is the diagnosis finally made of frontal temporal dementia and, and what then? So with frontotemporal um, frontal temporal lobe uh, dementia, um, getting back to the last question about imaging, we might see that the frontal lobe, the part of the brain that's here, this front part, um, is atrophied or it, there's volume loss. What we would anticipate as the normal size of that area of the brain, it's smaller, it's shrunk. Or we're also seeing the temporal lobes have had the same impact. The temporal lobes are on either side here. And we're looking to see on imaging if those have atrophied or are smaller um, than what would be anticipated as average. That would be a helpful clue, but not always, again, is the imaging going to line up with testing. There are very specific patterns to frontotemporal lobe dementia that are different than any other. And a lot of this is characterized by two critical factors. One of those is what we call semantic, meaning language. The temporal lobes are responsible for language. And we do have a group of frontotemporal lobe disease patients who really struggle with language. And they're struggling because there is significant disease progression to the temporal lobes, and sometimes the temporal lobes only. And memory and other parts of brain function remain fairly intact. The more problematic one, the one that I see a lot of, is where the damage is to the frontal lobe, or um, which is the area of the brain, at, if you go back to my slide on, on uh, domains. It's the executive function part. The executive function part of our brain um, and what we're testing for here is logic, judgment. Um, we're also testing for abstraction, working memory, 
uh, sustained and complex attention. And we're looking at impulsivity. The frontal lobe is responsible for inhibiting. It does a lot of brain regulation. No, stop, don't do that. And so a lot of our social skills, a lot of our behaviors are held in check because our frontal lobe is inhibiting other parts of our brain, our emotional centers or our impulsive centers and saying, no, I know you're hungry and you want to eat now, but you just had lunch. Wait, let that food settle in your stomach. Drink a glass of water. That's what our executive lobe does. But when, when that brain, or the uh, frontal lobe does, the executive function does that. But when that's broken, the impulses and the emotional regulation, the behaviors start to occur. And this is very, very serious. Um, it's especially serious because we, I tend to see a lot of behavioral problems and a lot of frontal lobe um, dementia occurring earlier. Um, this is a, often a pattern where this is a dementia that can occur in the 60s, uh, sometimes in people's 50s. Um, I think my wife even tested a gentleman who was in his 40s. Um, and there does seem to be um, a hereditary component to frontal lobe dementia, unlike others. Um, so, so we're learning and we know a lot more about this, but yes, this is, this is one of the dementias that's very, very worrisome and um, certainly one that takes a lot of scrutiny, but also a lot of care planning and treatment recommendations because it takes a, a, a strong natural support system um, but around this person, but it also takes a strong professional network too. Okay, thank you. So, Did I answer uh, all the questions with that? Uh, I think part of it is um, the what then part was, we just have so many uh, uh, people in our groups who are really struggling with placement, yeah, you know, yeah. um, handling their their behavior when you got this big guy and this little wife and those kind of things. Do you make those type of recommendations based on your testing? Yeah. Yeah, here, here again is where testing becomes helpful is um, not just the treatment recommendations, um, but it may also be uh, the care planning and determination of level of care. I, I find that um, invariably the behavior component, remember I talked before about the semantic. We talk about the frontal lobe with the, be, uh, with the behavior component as um, very often these are individuals that it's, it's not sustainable to have them at home. It is not due to a lack of love. It is not due to a lack of um, patience or empathy or desire to take care of a loved one who has this behavioral component, especially the frontal lobe dementia. You're, it's nobody's fault. It's a horrible disease. It simply becomes unable to be cared for at a low level of care. These are individuals that invariably require um, a locked memory care unit. And there are challenges in our community with resources and, um, and memory care. It is, um, we are very scarce on what's needed, especially on um, the absence of a locked memory care unit that takes Medicaid. And often these are individuals that really assisted living facilities, um, even skilled nursing facilities struggle to take care of. And often I don't think they're able to be cared for very well at adult family homes. Although I'm sure there's some that are, are able to manage them. Okay, thank you. So do you know if most people who are diagnosed with Parkinson's are at risk for Lewy body dementia? So 
technically, if you have Parkinson's disease and you develop dementia, your dementia is due to Parkinson's disease. Lewy body disease is a separate neurological condition. And it would be very hard to parcel out Lewy body disease comorbid or existing in, a, in conjunction with Parkinson's. I would say that it's one or the other. You either have Parkinson's disease and dementia or you have Lewy body disease and that dementia because the two are, are different. Um, Parkinson's dementia would be clearly defined because of a pre-existing diagnosis of Parkinson's. And usually I find that it's men with Parkinson's who are at a higher rate of, uh, or higher propensity um, to develop um, a dementia less so women with Parkinson's disease. And that's usually because Parkinson's is much worse on men than it is on women. Um, but, but Parkinson's dementia really doesn't have that bad of this forgetting or, um, or the hallucinations that are outright part of the disease. Hallucinations for Parkinson's patients is due to their cinnamon. And that's the medication they have to take so that they have um, fluid movement and they don't get rigid or freeze. Um, and when you reduce the cinnamon or adjust the dose, usually the hallucinations go away. That is not the case with Lewy body because with Lewy body disease, the visual hallucinations exist because of the disease. It's a symptom of it, and it's not due to a medication. And also with Lewy body, while you get movement things, like people falling out of bed because the, the part of the brain responsible to um, immobilize muscles when we're dreaming gets broken. And so they'll dream, and then they're kicking and and floundering in their dreams because, um, because of this part of the Lewy body disease damage to the brain, you fall out of bed a lot. Um, and the visual hallucinations, sometimes it'll be little, they'll see little things. Um, and then, but there's also the Alzheimer's component, meaning there is a clear amnestic or storage problem to memory. So if I said, I'm going to tell you five words, repeat them back to me, good, you got all five words. Now I'm going to ask you to tell me those, um, what were those five words in about 10 minutes from now? Very often for Lewy body disease, they will not remember those words, even if I give them a cue. Oh, wasn't one of the words a color? No, I don't think so. So that, that is what you see with Lewy body. That's not the same with Parkinson's. The reason why I think it's important to split these out is the treatment for Parkinson's disease is very different than what we would do for Lewy body disease. There are medications that we would pick for Parkinson's that we simply would not pick for Lewy body, but there would be some that would overlap. Um, we may choose cholinesterase drugs for both like Aricept or Exelon, maybe Nemenda for both Parkinson's and maybe for Lewy body. Um, but we would ne we, we might use antipsychotics for a brief period of time with Parkinson's disease to stop the hallucinations. More often than not, we would not want to um, consider antipsychotics with Lewy body disease because there's a large portion of Lewy body disease patients who get worse when you give them antipsychotics. It actually makes their condition um, progress um, or their symptoms uh, more um, worse. I'm not sorry, not, not to progress, but their symptoms get worse and it, or it doesn't help at all. So, so we avoid antipsychotics with those patients. And so it's very important to um, differentiate those two. It's good to maybe go to neurology. They'll be able to pull which one it is, maybe get a second opinion. 
And I would also say that this is, again, where neuropsychological testing would be very helpful to split this out and say, this is clearly Parkinson's or this is looking more like Lewy body. Do you have a consistent way of dealing with the individual who has uh, done the testing and when the results are back, they don't believe it? If they do not have, they don't think they have dementia? Yeah. Yeah. And, and what is your response? My response is to try to be as empathic as possible. I think one of the, I wanna share this to, with everyone is, one of the things we have to realize about testing is there's no do-overs, okay? There's no give backs. It's, it's in a word invasive. When, when we do testing, it's invaded your life and it becomes a fact. It, it's, it's, um, you, you, can't, you can't pretend that it, it's not there. You, um, and so I, I, I try to set up testing that way, that we're going to be doing this. You're, it, it's important, this is gonna be very helpful, but I, I always try to set up that um, I'm really trying to help, and we're going to discover some things, and some of these are things that you may may not like to know, but sometimes we just have to we just have to know them because not knowing is not an answer. <laughs> um, so when the feedback comes, I really try to empathize. It's hard sometimes to hear that there's something terribly wrong with you. And especially when there's such a stigma, I think, attached to dementia, we, we really hear it as something really awful about what's gonna happen to us, um, sort of like a end-stage cancer or end-stage renal disease. It can feel like a death sentence. And in, in some ways, it, it maybe, maybe it is I, I think because with Alzheimer's, it does such terrible things to people's lives and the and the ones closest to them. So I, I I don't I don't blame anyone for denying, right? That it can't be true. I think that's part of the grief, right? Is to begin by just saying no, no, right? I I don't believe it. Um, and, and sometimes it's just too much, but I, 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 I try not to rub it in because I don't think that's helpful to say, well, you're just in denial. You just don't want to hear it. It's true. The test said so. You know, I mean, where does that go, right? It, so I try to be informative, but at some point, you, I want to try to end that feedback session as nicely as possible and as empathic and reassuring as possible. And ideally, this is why somebody coming for a feedback session should come with, um, with trusted individuals who are part of their natural support system. Okay. And, and then the, the last question is, do you have resources in your office that, that you can steer people toward, okay, now you have this diagnosis and these are the resources that are available in the community? I have a few, but I don't think I have as many as Hope has. I mean, that's why I, I have your brochures. I have SWADs. Um, I think we have some uh, brochures for, um, oh, we have that, I think it's that Connections um, book. We have a few, and, and I know some people that are like part of placement agencies. Um, but I do not want to sound like I have some fantastic, amazing resources that maybe you're not already aware of. Oftentimes, I'm struck by the, at feedback sessions by how much patients know or their loved ones know that I don't know about resources in the community. I think I know the obvious ones, um, and I don't want to sound pretentious that I know more than that. Um, 
I maybe it's partly I'm a pragmatist and maybe a little bit pessimistic, just generally disappointed at the um, limits to the resources that we have in our community. There seems, um, like I mentioned before, I don't think we have enough locked memory care. I don't think we have necessarily all the in-between um, levels of care that would be ideal. Um, I think there's just so much more that other communities may have. Um, but again, a lot of this is funding and um, in energies to be uh, collaboratively to, um, for um, leadership to put these things into place and they, they don't exist right now. And so we're a lot of times limping along, doing the best we can with what we have. And I, and I think at this point, in terms of resources, it's more about how do we maximize the resources that we have for sure. um, in trying to discern that as best we can. All right. I think that's a really good answer, actually. So thank you so much. I so appreciate you doing this for us. You answered questions that I hear almost every week. So it's really worthwhile. Thanks again. Thank you so much for having me. And I really appreciate this opportunity and I want you to all know that my thoughts and blessings are with all of you so stay well and take good care of yourselves thank you bye-bye bye-bye thanks a lot <laughs>